I guess dogmatism really is my issue with this kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like, I've done a bunch of reading, like a bunch of reading on um, the Founding Fathers. Because first I watched, ha uh, I watched Hamilton, because that's always how it starts. And then I read up some stuff on that to go like, oh, that really did happen. Oh, that didn't happen, blah, blah. And then I got interested in that, and then it was basically like a Wikipedia spiral where I learned a bunch of stuff. And like, the the basic, the basic like outcome that I arrived at is one that totally reaffirms Marxian dialectical materialism. Like, totally, totally reaffirms that, you know? So, a bunch of the founding fathers, most of them, were anti-slavery. Obviously, a lot of them still own slaves. And, obviously, slavery persisted for a really long time. One of the beliefs they had, a mistake they made, pretty pr as close to an objective mistake as you can really get, um, is the fact that they thought that if they waited enough time, um, they could get rid of slavery, like, l like, ease it out. You know what I mean? Like, they could kind of peacefully transition it out, you know? And, of course, that ended up being completely wrong. 100% wrong. Um because it didn't end until the Civil War. They li literally, half the country, broke away. They would rather leave than give up their slaves, which is like, wow, you know? Um, but like, today in retrospect, that decision is really obvious. In their time, it definitely wouldn't have been. And while I disagree with what they did, and a lot of the decisions they made were morally reprehensible, what must be understood is that history is not a collection of individual people's moral proclivities. It's a collection of material forces that combine and fight against each other to arrive at different outcomes. Does that make sense? Um, so, you like, people miss the point when they look back and they, they look at, like, the Founding Fathers, and they're like, well, these guys made a mistake, and they were wrong, and they were so... Like, they were. Go for it. Like, you can, but that's not the point. The point is that if you look at the cumulative social forces in action at the time, abolishing slavery in 1776, or whenever the war was over, you know, let's just say 1796 or whatever, abolishing it during the beginning of Adam's presidency, was at the time a, a consideration which was just flatly unrealistic in their perception. Why is that, you know? Is it because it was just so ordinary to them at the time that they felt like there could be no alternative? Well, yeah. A lot of it was also that they had a lot of debts they owed after the Civil War and slavery. Hey, you don't uh, you don't have to uh, you don't have to pay for labor, as it turns out, if you can if you can believe it. Um, if you if you, if you can believe it, you know it's a little all that. I agree, Shu. I agree very very much. Um, so a lot of this stuff comes down to like basic material conditions or whatever, and a lot of it also comes down to lesser evilism. The issue is that lesser evilism is always happening everywhere all the time, you know? Revolutionaries do lesser evilism. The Founding Fathers were literally revolutionaries, and they did, uh, lesser evilism. They did it all the time, you know? They did it with slavery. There were tons of anti-slavery, um, Founding Fathers who, who were like, you know, um... Does that mean, like, the lesser evil they arrived at was good? No. And it's also a demonstration of how the lef lesser evil framework itself can be destructive. Because when you think of the dichotomy, if you think of the world as a dichotomy between a good option and a bad option, or, in this case, a terrible option and a slightly less terrible option, you maybe limit your way of thinking and prevent yourself from understanding that there are other better options possible. You could always go harder. You can always be more direct. You can always be more forceful. There's always something to do or something to say. And this nuance gets left out a lot in discussion that lefty circles tend to play into with um, with the Founding Fathers. When reading into the Founding Fathers and like, yeah, I've watched Neo-Slavery video from Knowing Better. It's super good. Um, having read a lot more in the Founding Fathers, I have such a strong respect for some of them, such a weak respect for some of them, but, like, I feel like such a better understanding of what forces cause compromise in difficult situations. Does that make any sense? You know what I mean? Like, imagine a proletarian revolution, right? Like, even a proletarian revolution with, like, super mega cool socialists or whatever, you know, they're like super giga chad proletarian socialists. Like, they're going to have to make compromises. Like, if they're paying for a war effort, they might, they might have to, like, conscript labor, or they might have to, like, you know, draft soldiers. They might have to blah, blah, blah. And it's bad, but it's like, we, if we don't do this, we lose the war, right? Like, if we don't do this, we're done. We're done so, you know? Um, and oftentimes they're right, and oftentimes they're wrong, and history often is what decides, and learning from that is 
really, really, really interesting. It's really interesting, you know? Because I, I hopefully it would make you more understanding in the future of when uh, when decisions can and can't be made, what can and can't be done, like what, what the available options on the table actually are. Which of the Founding Fathers do you appreciate the most? I don't know if there's any one of the Founding Fathers that I appreciate the most. Um, there, there's, like, things they all kind of represent, I guess. In terms of, like, overall who the most impressive person was, it was probably George Washington, right? Like, the Founding Fathers bickered a lot with each other, but everyone respected George Washington. He was like the adult in the room, basically. Um, he, um, yeah, he, in, in terms of, like, keeping everything together, like, he, he, he was like a stabilizing force. Um, that doesn't mean he was a great person or whatever. Again, Virginia, plantation, blah de blah you know. Um, so was it a complete myth the colonies left Britain because they wanted to keep their slaves? That's not really true. Um, yeah, that's not really true. Um, John, John Adams did some pretty base stuff, didn't he? But he also did the Alien Sedition Acts, which are really, really bad. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I wasn't really, um... I wasn't really keeping it all. It was more for religious freedom. Nah, the religious freedom thing's also kind of a meme. It's it's complicated. It's complicated. It's all this is all so complicated. Let's not Yeah, let's let's not <laughs> I'm not a historian. I don't want to embarrass myself. Um Yeah. Uh yeah, there's there's a lot. There's there's some there's some stuff there. Whoa! Um What was I saying? Fuck. Wait, there was something else I was saying. Oh, a lot of this historical stuff also becomes a lot more weird in retrospect. Like, the political divide back in the day was not what we had today, you know? The big divide at the founding of the party, like, you know this if you watch Hamilton, but the big divide at the beginning was between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. And in a unique departure from how politics works today, neither side of them was objectively retarded, you know? Like, basically today we have Democrats who are milk toast liberals who have some good ideas but don't go far enough and you have republicans who are death cultists who are horrible and just objectively bad <laughs> so it's, it's you know great great you know but back in the day you know with the federalist and democratic republicans both actually had fairly meaningful arguments very true show oh that's how i started this yeah i was talking about hamilton um yeah, if you can believe it, there was actually, like, two reasonable sides. Not to say I, I agree with both on, on everything, you know. Um, the, the, big, the big difference was, like, political stylings, right? The Federalist Party wanted a strong central government, and they tended to lean politically more with um, their former masters, England, you know. Um, and the Democratic Republicans tend to lean more with France and wanted a decentralized government with, um, with uh, uh, more... Um, is that all the mini skeletons? With more sympathy towards revolutionary France. Um, in a lot of ways, Hamilton was kind of a conservative for his time. Um, Hamilton had kind of a fixation, both personally and aesthetically, with the British aristocracy. Um, he his his plan to consolidate the debt federally was opposed because there was a concern that. Um, British moneylenders could buy U.S. debt if it was grabbed by the federal government, which would mean essentially that, like, Americans would be paying back the debts of the war they fought to free themselves from Britain to British moneylenders, which was, like, very not okay with a, with a lot of Americans. Um, oh, yeah, and, 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 and Hamilton, yeah, he was quite imperious in a lot of respects. Didn't Hamilton want Washington to be a king? He didn't want there to be a... He wanted uh, presidential appointments to be for life. He was on good terms with Washington, and basically he didn't believe in, like, constant representative democracy. So he basically felt like a president should just be, like, an aristocrat. They totally missed this in the musical. In one of the songs, he's like, hey, Washington, don't resign. But they don't bring up the fact that, like, he, he basically did want a president to be, like, a... Like a monarch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just a non-hereditary one. When they die, they get elected by by the by the yeah. Um, there are other things about Hamilton though that are like pretty progressive. It's not it's it's not like he was just an authoritarian, right? Like um, he was uh, furiously anti-slavery. Um, he was uh, interestingly he was very pro-Semitic, 
Uh, this also doesn't get brought up in the musical, but when he was growing up in the Caribbean, he grew up with a group of Jewish uh, Caribbean people. Um, and he, he actually believed... He was actually like a full-on, like... Like, he was a weirdo about it. He actually believed Semitic people were superior to the, to the like, white people. Or to, um... To, um... What, what's the term? Not Goyim. Uh, the, the other, um... The, for, for non-Jews. Gentiles, yeah. He, he, I think he actually, he did believe Jews were superior to Gentiles. He thought they were, a, a, like, a, 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 t a better type of person, divinely chosen. He believed the whole, like, God's chosen people thing as a non-Jew. Uh, which is interesting. Yeah. He was also, um, a really, really feisty dude, you know? Uh, you know how in the, in the musical he's portrayed as, like, like, kind of peace-loving? Because when his son goes to duel, he's like, hey, throw away your shot. And then when he goes to duel, he throws away a shot. Um, in, in real life, he challenged people to duels all the fucking time. It, it, in fact, like, he, because, because one of the things, like in his biography, which I, I read, I read a little bit of, one of his things was like, most of the founding fathers were aristocrats. They were British nobility who became revolutionaries. He wasn't. He was broke as fuck. Um, and as a product of that, he, he had the same, like, super scrappy, I'll fight you over any disrespect attitude that, like, fucking poor people in prison have. You know what I mean? Like, like, aristocrats are, are, were taught to, like, take an insult on the cheek and, like, get over it, basically. Like, you know, keep a stiff upper lip, you know, that sort of thing. Um, he had that attitude in Act 1. Yeah, 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 but it was way worse than they portrayed in the musical. He was aggressive. And, um, and he, uh, very frequently, when people, uh, would write about him in ways he didn't like, he would actually challenge them to a duel, which got half a dozen people to retract or amend statements that they made in the press, because they didn't want him to shoot them. Um, which is, which is basically like, it's basically like the old-timey version of a, um... Of, like, a, 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 like, threatening to sue a person for libel or whatever, except... Ex except it was a duel. Um, yeah, and they all backed out of it. And, and one of the reasons he accepted the duel with Burr is because he had done that so many times that, like, he can't really back down after all that. Does that make any sense? Um, because he, because he'd spent his whole life doing that, so... Are you saying he was like Trump? Well, he's a really smart guy. Like, you can read him... Like, you can read his writings. I I've said this before, but, like, the America the, the most impressive people in America's history are, like, disproportionately concentrated in our founding fathers. And I think the reason for that is because being a revolutionary tends to um, encourage the most exceptional behavior. You know what I mean? Like, any dipshit can be a president today. All you have to do is be some rich fail son who, like, like networks his way to the top like okay great you know what i mean like all right like cool okay yeah um how trump you look back on 100 years well hopefully not positively shoe low-key his fault he got shot dueled people all the time then threw away a shot against burr no he didn't duel them the 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 people in the press retracted i think i don't think burr was his first duel but he he didn't duel people that often they they would retract their statements I think he mostly threatened to duel people who were lying about him in the press. He was lied about in the press pretty pretty often. Yeah, Thomas Paine's super cool. Um duel people right often. But people turned down pretty often as well. Um The writing the writing on the duel itself is pretty interesting. A lot of the stuff is mentioned explicitly in the play. Um the doctor that was brought to the duel with Burr was the same doctor that presided over, um, over his son when he dueled. Uh, oh, yeah, they dueled near where his son died. And, um, I'm trying to think. Oh, yeah, um, there were two gunshots. Like, the question is, like, did he actually throw away a shot? The, there were two gunshots at the duel. Hamilton did fire, but everyone had their back turned, so nobody knows who fired first. Um, obviously also, if at the time you said you did know who fired first, you would be admitting to having witnessed it, which would put you legally in a bad situation, so they didn't do that. Um, but, um, 
I think... So, I think there was a separation of about three seconds between the two shots. And when Hamilton was getting wheeled away by the doctor... Wait, you weren't allowed to watch? Um, no, because if you're a witness to the crime, you're like a... You're, you're like, um... And it like an enable. I, I don't know. It's a whole legal thing. Look, they turned their back. It says so in the play. Okay, that's the true thing that did happen. Doctor turned around so they could have deniability. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> anyway, um, you're an accessory. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, there were two shots. Nobody knows who fired first. Only that there was a difference of a few seconds between those two shots, which means one of two things. One is that Burr fired first, and then a few seconds after being shot between the ribs, Hamilton fired a stray shot. Or two, which is much more evil, Hamilton fired first, missed deliberately, and then Burr, taking careful aim, shot him in the chest after knowing Hamilton couldn't fire back. Um, my personal opinion from what I read, which, again, it's just an opinion, it's not a fact or whatever, but from what I, from what I read, I feel like Burr fired first, and Hamilton accidentally fired a few seconds later. The reason for that is because um, when he was getting wheeled away, uh, Hamilton said to be careful with his gun because it hadn't yet been fired uh, and the trigger was light. But he had fired. So that suggests to me that he might have fired accidentally sometime after he'd been shot and didn't realize it because he had a bullet in his stomach. Um, that would be my guess, you know? Hard to say. Oh, after the um, after the Burr conspiracy, several decades later, um, Burr got divorced from his wife, and the um, the lawyer who proceeded over the divorce proceedings was no shit. Um, Alexander Hamilton Jr. Wait for real? Yeah, yeah, for real. So basically, that means that when Burr's wife, all that time later, um, when when Burr's wife wanted to divorce. She was like, what lawyer can I find? And she finds the son of the guy that Burr famously killed. How fucking wild is that? How, how, how do you feel uh, 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 Alexander Jr. felt about that one, huh? Like, imagine you're a fucking, like, civic lawyer, and you get a case to represent a woman in the divorce proceeding against the man who killed your father. Fuck me, dude. Holy shit. He must have he must have put his all into that case, you know what I mean? He must have he would he he's pouring over the fucking legal books like all right, we need to take every fucking cent out of this guy's account. Okay, you he's like doing fractions on the pennies or some shit. Yeah. Oh, let me pick up this stuff. I hate this area. No. It doesn't really matter if I die. Goodbye. True so far. Talked about Madison Gawthorn saying the GOP is coke orgies. Yeah, I really need to talk about that. Yeah, shoot. Shoot, listen, okay? The GOP doesn't care if you dress and drag fuck men or fuck kids. Uh, what the GOP cares about is if you keep your mouth shut. And the moment Madison Cawthorn calls out the rest of the GOP for being degenerate, when, like, he himself is degenerate, you know? They're both, they're all degenerate. Of course they're all degenerate, you know? Then all of a sudden, like, 50,000 drops appear on him about every crime he's ever committed in his whole life. Yeah. You give us a presidential tier list sometime? Those are so high effort. You're so wrong, wrong about the founders, what the fuck? Wait, what did I say? What did I say that was wrong? Cawthorn is being primaried? I don't... I uh, We'll see how things go. I don't know. People just think you're being too nice? I don't think... Man, people engage in so much, like, historical... Like, like, his, like, a historical political framing. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know. There's a lot to be learned from the Founding Fathers. It kind of bothers me that conservatives have a monopoly on that rhetoric. Because, like, the Founding Fathers would probably have modern Republicans killed. Like, to be clear, modern Republicans are so crazy that the Founding Fathers probably would have had them executed alongside, like, the, the Loyalists. They probably would have been the Loyalists, you know? Um... But, like, the the founding... Yeah, like, yeah. Um, it, it, like, ridiculously so. But for some reason, it seems like the, found, the, the, the Republicans are the only ones who talk about how the Founding Fathers were actually, like, pretty interesting and cool in a lot of ways. 
which which sucks. I think that you can be like anti-American in the way that I am, while also recognizing that America's founding, um, you know, had a, had a lot of at least very interesting people involved. It, to me, it's not even patriotism. It's just um, just an acknowledgement of like the the extraordinary uh, considerations. Stop. I'm not finding anyone here. This area sucks. Let me get my shit. You all enjoying the riveting DS2 gameplay? It's not easy, you know. Uh, maybe Spark News. Jefferson um, banned all trade during his presidency and collapsed the economy because of his absolutely idiotic ideas about the economy. Yeah, wasn't that him trying to undo the shit that Hamilton did? Didn't they make a joke about that at the end of the play? Where, where, where Jefferson says, I gotta give him credit, his financial system is genius. I couldn't undo it if I tried, and I tried. Yeah. It's pretty funny. Jefferson was a salty boy. Oh, so salty. Oh, interesting tidbit that I learned about the um, the Reynolds pamphlet. Uh, the the document that Hamilton wrote to... Um, oh, boy. No. The document that um, that Hamilton wrote to exonerate himself of allegations of speculation by saying that he had an affair. Um, uh, interestingly, so in, in, in real life, that wasn't Jefferson and Burr and stuff. Like, for the purposes of the play, they had to keep the number of characters limited and they wanted to keep things kind of thematically consistent, but it's not like Jefferson, Madison, and Burr all, like, fucking snap dance their way right up to him. And we're like, hey, we we're the we're blackmailing you, you know, like that that didn't happen. Um, the 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 accusations of um, speculation were widespread against Hamilton for the most part, with rumors being led against a few of the many 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 prominent people who fucking hated Hamilton. Um, there's quite quite a, quite, a, quite a few people who didn't like the guy. Um, and um, one thing that was interesting is that after Hamilton privately showed the letter from Reynolds to the people who were blackmailing him, um, they then went off and Hamilton told all of them to say publicly that they knew why Hamilton was not guilty of the crime of speculation. So basically, he privately showed all of them evidence that the money was because of an affair, and he was like, okay... I don't want knowledge of the affair spreading, but I do need this rumor off my back. So can all of you go out there and say, like, I can't say why, but I know that he's innocent. And of the three men Hamilton had that conversation with, two of them agreed. One of them didn't. I forget the name of the third person. God damn it. I forget the name of the third person, but one of them, because they hated Hamilton so much, refused to publicly exonerate him. And it was because of that guy that Hamilton wrote the Reynolds pamphlet. And interestingly, Elizabeth, Hamilton's wife, forgave Hamilton pretty soon after the affair was made public. But she died 60 years later, having never forgiven that man. She, she lived to like 95 or something. She forgave Hamilton for the affair pretty quickly, but she never forgave the guy who wouldn't publicly exonerate Hamilton. That's fucking Potty. Yeah, yeah, she hated him, like, vocally despised him for the rest of her life. Like, till 1850 or some shit. Like, yeah. That'd be Blablato. She was his ride or die. They were, they were pretty ride or die. No real historical evidence of there being any kind of romantic interest between, um... Um... What's the other sister's name? Um... Not, not Eliza, um... Angelica. Uh, Angelica Sch uh, Schuyler. Yeah. Um, no evidence of an affair between them. Whatever. Um, damn it. Ah, we almost avoided the poison. Whatever, I'll wait it out. Um, yeah, Indy Jones. I love I love NATO. No. The founders were stuff. Anar Anarcho-Stalinism. Chill. You're screaming in chat. So it's okay. There was Lawrence, though. Um, yeah. So, Lawrence, he's the character in the first act of Hamilton who died... Uh, at the end of the war. It's actually a really sad and real story. Oh, this is where you can get the booby armor. 
these sorceresses basically one hit kill you, but they have their tits out in a way that no other creature or character or person or whatever in um in this game has. I'll show you if I get the armor. Um what was I saying? Um Oh, oh, Lawrence um is the character in the first act. He's the one with the all black battalion, and uh and it's true. Um he did lead battalions of slaves to fight against the British in the hopes of using their their service and their patriotism to get them freed from slavery. You can see their tits. Can you see their tits? War slaves? No, no, no. They were given the chance. They, they weren't conscripted. They were given the chance to fight. Um, and um, La Lawrence, like, said basically, like, hey, you know, so he was anti-slavery. Lawrence was so anti-slavery. Did it work? No. After the war, the slaves were returned to their masters. Um, yeah. But that was what Lawrence tried tried to push for. Lawrence died. Um, Lor yeah, he's mega anti-slavery. Lawrence died at the end of the war, um, which kind of facilitated the return of the, of the slaves to their masters. Which, in a really sad way, too. Um, Lawrence died... Uh, in a skirmish with um, with with British soldiers, just like after the war had ended, like there were there were like marauding bands of British soldiers that hadn't made their way back to to England yet, that were kind of living off the countryside for for months after. And Lawrence um, was, I think he was leading the detachment, and he insisted on leading the raid against those Englishmen, like. He, he went on horseback, even though they were just routing a few dozen people with a much larger force. He insisted on leading the charge to, to kill them. Um, and he got shot. Yeah, just a random fucking bandit encounter, like a goddamn RPG. Yeah, he was super young. He was younger than me. He was 27. Oh, also, according to a report from an officer who was a part of his detachment, he spent the last night of his life engaged in, and I think I'm almost quoting here, Repsodious pleasure with a number of local ladies who left delighted. I think that's actually a quote from the officer who wrote on his on his last few days. Um, apparently, he just had some like hot bitches in his tent, and it was just just fucking all over the place, like the night before. So that's good. Apparently, he got shot early morning, so that could have been like just six hours before, you know. These will one hit you. All these fireballs one hit you. Thank you. Look at how, look how much their tits are out. It's crazy how much their tits are out. Sounds like maybe he wanted to die. No, 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 no. The, he he's he he was just a, a rowdy lad. Oh, um, one of the coolest people in the revolution by far, and is uh, featured massively in Hamilton. Is Lafayette and holy fuck he is actually so cool it's actually like fucking crazy how badass Lafayette is I, I don't I don't think I learned about him at all in school which might just be me having a bad memory oh by the way there were there are multiple historical accounts and letters from antiquity which suggests that uh, Hamilton might have been gay for Lafayette and for Lawrence um but yeah, uh, uh, yeah, understandable, of course. Uh, he, yeah, he wrote some very friendly stuff about those. But, um, there's a street named after him in New York. Lafayette, I think, has his name emblazoned on more shit here in America than any other foreigner in all of history. Um, I know, Shu. La so, Lafayette was basically, like, the double revolutionary. Like, he supported a revolution in America and in France. He fought in the American Revolutionary War, and then he went off to France to help them fight, the revolutionaries there, then convinced the French government to bring uh, uh, ships to, um, to, to America to help them fight the British, and then he went back to France uh, to continue his revolutionary efforts. And he actually got to live a really long time. His story actually has kind of a happy ending. He was arrested under Napoleon's government, when, of course, the revolution failed and Napoleon came to power. Um, he was arrested, uh, but not killed, because apparently Napoleon had respect for him. After Napoleon was exiled, 
um, he was given an invitation by the powers that be in France to become, and I'm not kidding here, the dictator of France. He was so loved that the people of France were willing to accept him as a dictator. He declined the position, of course, because he didn't believe in dictatorship. And a short time after that, he did a tour of the United States, which had been developing for some decades as an independent country. And I believe that uh, the his appraisal, um, I believe that his reception in the United States is described to be um, jubilant. Like, basically, he went on a state-by-state -state tour, and they threw, like, festivals for him everywhere. Because he was, like, the revolutionary Frenchman, you know? Um, so, yeah. He, he got, uh, yeah. He, he, he you know. Nah, pen, one, two, three. I want people to be understanding of history, but, you know, sometimes that's how stuff goes. Yeah, and there are squares, um, named all, all over the place after him. He has, like, eight towns. It, yeah, it's, it's crazy how much shit is named after him for, for a foreigner, you know? Um... Very moderate by French Revolution standards. To be fair, some of those French revolutionaries got a little kooky, okay? To, to, you know, to be fair, you know. Okay, maybe moderate by French Revolutionary standards, but, uh, you know, so, some of them... Some of them are a little, 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 little wacky. A little wacky they were. Did you... Have you seen the part of the Lindsay Ellis video on the Hunchback of Notre Dame where she's talking about the history of the actual Notre Dame? And one of the things she notes is that all the beheaded statues up near the parapets of the of Notre Dame, they were beheaded by French revolutionaries who thought they were the heads of European monarchs when they were actually like the twelve disciples of Christ. It's a cathedral. Why would those statues be of monarchs? They were they were they were religious figures, and the people who beheaded them were Christian. It's like, Okay. Yeah. Based atheist French present Keck W. Oh yeah, they were there were some militantly atheist elements of the um of the French Revolution. They were they wanted they wanted to like make a religion out of atheism and skepticism. The idea was like the world had been dominated by religiosity for such a long time, and then the Enlightenment happened, and they like, you know, a lot of these revolutionaries were very radical. And by the way, yeah, yeah, the Church of Reason. Now mind you they also did some bad stuff. The Church of Reason is the most Lay-Retta atheist thing in the world. Yeah. The Church of Reason. A new belief system created to replace Christianity. The Cult of Reason, which was based on the ideals of reason, virtue, and liberty. It sounds great, right? Um... <laughs> uh... Um, they, I'm pretty sure they did some wacky stuff. They, they, they did some, they did some wacky stuff. A, little, a few, yeah, they, they had a few gamer moments. Cult of Reason, composition, festival, the festival of reason. In the spring of 1794, the cult of reason was faced with official repudiation when Robespierre, nearing complete dictatorial power during the reign of terror, announced his own establishment of a new deistic religion for the Republic, the Cult of the Supreme Being. I don't think enough people talk about how fucking wild Robespierre was. He was not- he was a wacky dude! Those- those French revolutionaries were wacky guys! Um, yeah. Yeah, he was- he was a, a little- he was a little bit fucking insane. Um, yeah, that fell apart. With Bonaparte. It is so fucking... It is so typical for a group of atheists to overthrow a religious monarchy and attempt to enshrine the values of the Enlightenment into the world by creating something called the Cult of the Supreme Being, which ascribes religious significance to the principles of the Enlightenment. How badly can you miss the point? What do you think religion does? Okay. Jesus. I'm sorry. It's... <laughs>